Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. It's an enormous pleasure to be back here on this great occasion, partly to give thanks to the Mitsubishi UFJ Trust and Banking Corporation, uh, who Sir Peter Tapsell, who is sitting on the front bench almost opposite me, uh, who was given his first paper speech by my father, I'm pleased to say, uh, organised 25 years ago. Uh, 25 years ago, when I was here, you'll be appalled to know of all the things that happened, the worst, it was when the ceiling of the bar fell in. Now, this had two disadvantages, one for the people sitting underneath it, it um, <laughs> was somewhat uncomfortable for them and not the result of the beer. Uh, the second, which upset even more undergraduates who had just paid their subscription, uh, was that the bar was closed for a period, causing considerable inconvenience and thanks to the enormous generosity of Mitsubishi UFJ, the union building is now in really first class condition and I'm really honoured to be here uh, to thank them on behalf of everybody and to thank Sir Peter uh, for having managed to do it. And then to talk on my favourite subject, which I can do for many hours, but I'm told I've only got uh, ten minutes. Fortunately, so much of the argument has been made by my honourable friend, the member for St Peter's, uh, who put the case with admirable brevity and wit. The honourable gentleman, the member from Lincoln, unfortunately was not as accurate in what he had to say. Uh, just sort of little points that one picks up. He was unaware that Scotland had more Conservative MPs than Labour MPs as late as the 1950s. So it's not the case that Scotland has always been this socialist haven. That's a very modern innovation and a sorry one for the Scots. Um, <laughs> he, talked, he talked about the common fisheries policy. This is the first time I've ever heard anybody tell our bankrupted fishermen who have been put out of business by the European Union that it's good for them because they can go and fish in Spain. No, it's not good for them because they can go and fish in Spain. It's bad for them because we used to have the greatest fish resources in our territorial waters which have been taken by industrial Spanish fishing. So we have bankrupted our fishermen, not given them this great hope. And then Croatia. Well, I sit on the European Scrutiny Committee and the European Commission itself put forward documents saying that Croatia had failed to meet its targets for an independent judiciary, failed to meet its targets for getting corruption out of the police force. Oh, but we'd let them in anyway because we believe broadly in enlargement and the process has gone on so long now it'd be a frightful bore to stop. So it's not something that makes people do what they say, it's something that supports the European Union in getting uh, what it wants and following its policy objectives. But let's just look at this issue of democracy within the European Union and the threat posed by it. My honourable friend from St Peter's has already told you about the scandalous Irish experience where if the people give a wrong result, they have to get to vote again until they give the right result. That happened in Denmark as well, and it happened in Holland and it happened in France. Though in the case of Holland and France, what did they do? They changed the Constitutional Treaty into the Lisbon Treaty and then didn't allow anyone to vote at all. So you just push it through because if the electorate don't like it, well, you try and get another electorate who may like it. But the whole basis, the structures are not democratic. Let us take the three pillars. The um, commission, first of all, entirely appointed. No democratic element in that. The council of ministers, that bit that represents the ministers who go out from this country and others to represent us. Decision-making in the Council of Ministers is now almost entirely made by qualified majority voting. And I thought you'd be interested to know that the UK has 29 votes in this system, <laughs> compared to Malta that has three. That means per head of Maltese population, they have 15 times more influence in the Council of Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, than you do. So we're back to rotten boroughs, really, that you, I mean, not a bad thing, you may say. <laughs> you may like this, when they were abolished, it was said that no more could young people get into Parliament, and as so many of you may be looking to parliamentary careers, you may think we should introduce one or two for you at the next election, but you'd better go off to Malta, because that's the rotten borough of the European Union. <laughs> when it comes to the European Parliament, they're not 15 times better represented than us, it's a more modest 10 times better represented than we are. So what sort of a democracy is that? It's not one person, one vote, it's a gerrymandered voting system to support the objectives of the European Union. And then I think the most scandalous is the European Court, because the rule of law is essential to any understanding of democracy. It is the platform, the foundation that democracy is built upon. And the European Court 
has very serious flaws. First of all, it is a political court that it is committed to pushing the federalist, integrationist uh, agenda without the support uh, of the people. But it also breaks and has broken and continues to break one of the fundamental principles of justice, which is no man must be judge in his own cause. And I shall tell you the specific case, because it is outrageous that this should happen and undermines any residual trust one might have had in that body. During the financial crisis, the governments, the council, went along to the European Commission and said, we think there's a big financial crisis, so big that the wages of people working for the Commission should not be increased in line with the old formula, as provided for in the treaties, if there is a sufficient crisis. The Commission, whose salaries were about to be cut, said, no, we don't want our salaries cut, thank you very much, and they took the Council to the European Court. And the European Court, the judges sat there, thinking if we agree with the Council, we will cut our own salaries. So even at the worst financial crisis in most of our lifetimes, the Court ruled it was not sufficient, and they ruled that they should be paid more, undermining that fundamental point of justice. Nemo judex in causa sua, as I'm sure all the lawyers say. Different type of sewer that the judges live in, as far as I can tell. <laughs> and let me move on from that to what is being done by the Euro. Because my honourable friend from St Peter's talked about Mario Monti. Now I imagine this distinguished audience, the cream of the intellect of not only the nation but the world, would not be the fan club of Mr Berlusconi. Indeed, if I were to do a poll, I doubt there would be many putting their hand up to say that they thought he was a great and decent and honest man. They may disapprove of his private life. They may think it was not quite a way a gentleman behaves. <laughs> but nonetheless, Mr Berlusconi was democratically elected. And it was not for the Europe European Commission to say he must go and we're going to put in our man, we're going to put in Mr Mario Monti. Governments, democratically elected, have been thrown out in Greece as well. They have been thrown out uh, in Italy by the fiat of unelected bankers at the European Central Bank and Commission members at the European Commission. This is a real assault on democracy because it means that what the electorate wants is overruled uh, by the commissioners. For our own people, one of the main purposes of a Member of Parliament is to provide redress of grievance. It is why Members of Parliament make surgery appointments with their constituents. So that if something goes wrong, somebody is unfairly, badly treated, I can go to the Minister in Parliament and I can say my constituent has been treated badly. And if I'm right, if my constituent is right, this very often gets changed. Our system in that respect works remarkably well with one key exception. That is if it's an area of European competence. And then there is nothing that can be done. And I will give you a specific example. A constituent of mine who came to me, a farmer, who was being fined because a cow of his had died and he had not got the registration papers in in time. He'd posted them in time, but the cow, careless animal that it was, had died between Christmas and the New Year when the post office is not working at its best, whatever its best is nowadays. But nonetheless, <laughs> because of the failures of the post office, his notification was a day late, and therefore he was fined. I wrote to a very good minister, actually a Lib Dem minister, but nonetheless a very good, able man. <laughs> oh, so I wasn't being particularly party political, I was trying to be nice. Um, and he wrote back saying, it's too bad. So I wrote again, and I said, no, no, this is really unfair. This man did nothing wrong. And then the reply comes back, it doesn't matter what you or I think, this is decided by Europe, and if I, as the Minister, use my discretion such as it is, the United Kingdom will be fined. So redress of grievance when it's European smashes in to a brick wall, a brick wall that is fundamentally anti-democratic. But, Mr President, it is, I fear, worse than this, because as we see this lack of democracy, 
We are also beginning to see extremism on the rise in Europe for the first time since the 1930s. When you see what the euro does to countries, the crushing of their economies, the enforced austerity without that safety valve of devaluation, you see that happening and you see extremist parties rise. In Greece, there is the new dawn. We have heard that members of the new dawn have been arrested. Now, that should trouble you on two counts. Either they've been rightly arrested, in which case the electors have returned people accused of murder and other very serious crimes, or else they have been wrongly arrested, and we are back to where we were in January 1642, when five members of our own parliament were sent for by the king, that we are facing a fundamental attack on democracy. So either way, that arrest should make you tonight sleep less well in your beds. But it's not just the new dawn, it's the five-star party in Italy, a cranky party of the most peculiar kind that will not settle down to form a government. It's got elected and says, thank you very much, now we're elected, we're not going to do anything. Well, not really a very good way to run a country. And why has it come about? Because of the pressures of the European Union bearing down on the democratic systems uh, of the Italians. And in France, Miss Le Pen, taking on the mantle of her father, now has about 25% in the opinion polls for those looking to vote in European elections. So what is this great experiment doing? It is helping once again the rise of the extreme right, and in some cases, the extreme left. That is the threat to democracy that is there, that is coming, that is deeply destructive. But the fundamental problem, the real issue at hand tonight, is that there is less democracy in this country because of the European Union. Because, ladies and gentlemen, however you vote at the next general election, 60% of our laws, and some say higher, is made on the basis of European agreements where the Maltese proportionately outvote us 15 to 1. Whoever you vote for matters less than whoever somebody in Malta votes for about the laws of our country. And if you're unsatisfied with that, if you want it changed, I can't give you any redress because the United Kingdom Parliament, the most ancient democratic parliament in the world, has been made powerless. That is the threat to democracy. It is here, but it is on the continent as well. It is a frightening spectre. The best way to deal with it is to deal with our relationship with the European Union, to put our own democracy first and foremost, and hope that others follow.